All right, so my case was on Flickia versus Lackawanna College in Pennsylvania, 2017. My name is Megan Ingalls. This is the first page of the case document from Westlaw Database. You can see at the bottom, it is in fact from that database. Some facts of the case. So we start with two student athletes. They play football, Felicia and Resch. They suffered injuries on March 29, 2010, while participating in a famously dangerous tackling drill at Lackawanna College, which is a junior nonprofit private college in Pennsylvania. Traditionally, the college does have two licensed athletic trainers supporting the football program, but they had recently resigned at the time of this case. So the college had hired Ms. Coyne and Ms. Boynes, who are two recent graduates who had bachelor's degrees in athletic training, but they were not certified or licensed athletic trainers. They had, in fact, actually recently failed their um, licensing exams. The job titles were unofficially changed to be first responders instead of athletic trainers, but the language was not updated regarding their job description in any formal document. Um, a former professor and a former athletic trainer that worked with both these women at their previous institutions had reached out to the athletic director at Lackawanna and expressed their concern about the new hires as they were not qualified and ill-equipped. And they were, in fact, the only training staff working on March 29th, 2010, the date of this incident. Both Flickia and Resch had initially signed a waiver agreeing not to sue the college for any football-related injuries, but they claimed negligence of the college and requested punitive damages for not having proper medical personnel available. So, is the college required to have qualified medical personnel present at college athletic events to satisfy a duty of care to the student-athletes? And is an exculpatory clause releasing any and all liability signed in connection with participation in intercollegiate football enforceable as to negligence? So the court looked at some relevant law um, in support of the students, it's looking at Tayar versus Camelback Ski Corporation. The Tayar family went skiing at Camelback Ski Resort. They signed a release form, and Barbara Tayar got struck by other tubers coming down the hill, resulting in leg fractures. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court addressed whether it is public policy to release reckless behavior in a pre-injury exculpatory clause, ultimately deciding it is against public policy and ruled in favor of the Tayar family. Such releases are ultimately unenforceable. Then Kleinconnect versus Gettybird College, student athlete or lacrosse player, he ended up suffering cardiac arrest at practice. There was no athletic trainers present, and he ended up dying. The court determined the court has a duty to be reasonably prepared for handling medical emergencies that may arise during college sport participation. So looking at these precedents set, waivers cannot be enforced when language is unclear that negligent acts are, un are included in the waiver. The law confirms that colleges have a duty of care to their students regardless of waivers they signed. They need to provide proper resources to ensure their safety and security, and in this specific case, proper medical personnel. So the final decisions of the court were as follows. The defendants, Lackawanna College, did not demonstrate any concern for the safety of their student athletes. The college owed the student athletes a duty of care. The college had a duty to its student athletes to provide qualified medical personnel and provide adequate treatment if a student athlete suffers a medical emergency and to prioritize their health and safety. The waiver is not enforceable because the waiver did not state in clear and unambiguous terms that it would excuse Lackawanna's own negligent behavior, nor can it be used as a shield against claims of recklessness or gross negligence. The court stated the college's hiring and use of Coyne and Boignes as athletic trainers fell below the applicable standard of care. This conduct should be considered gross negligence and recklessness. Also, a jury must determine whether the first responders were acting as athletic trainers and if the college's employment of them was negligence resulting in harm of the student employees, the student athletes. A jury must also determine whether the tackling drill is part of football, so if any injury arises during the drill, it is an inherent risk of football. And how this case applies to higher education practice. This case did not rule that all athletic programs need to have licensed athletic trainers present at their practices, but we may see that in the future if more issues arise. Cases in regard to negligence involving signed waivers may expect to be taken to trial in the future, possibly creating more cases colleges have to get involved with. This might ultimately result in college athletics realizing waivers signed by the student athletes do not protect the institution as much as they once hoped. Moving forward, schools must also be more aware and specific about the language in their legal documents. The Flacomon altered the language students had to sign about having athletic trainers available to what the truth was at the time. This might have ended differently. At the end of the day, institutions need to always have the best interests of their students at the front of all things they do. Thank you.